Hello! Welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 79 The Fundamentals of Extended Techniques with Robert Dick, Part 1. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable, from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. Welcome, everyone, to another Flute 360 podcast episode. I am so glad you are here, and I cannot wait to introduce the one and only Mr. Robert Dick to the show. And we are going to talk today about the fundamentals of extended techniques. Welcome, Robert. Hi there. How are you doing today? Good. Yourself? I'm I'm fine. It's um, actually quite a beautiful day here in New York. Um, I hope... The scorching days of summer are behind us, and the drizzling days of fall are ahead of us, and right now, it's really beautiful. Nice. I'm so jealous because I'm in Corpus Christi right now, and it's super muggy. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am not a humidity type of girl. It's it's gross. Yeah, I, I've been to um, the Texas Gulf in the summertime, <laughs> and yeah, the atmosphere just sort of pastes itself to you. Yeah, it does. (laughs) You get ready for the day, you go outside, and then you're just like, ew, I feel like I need to take another shower again. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So you went to the farmer's market this past weekend. I did. Um, In Manhattan, we have a huge one at Union Square. And um, I was shopping for some guests. I made dinner for some friends um, on Sunday night. And so I went to the farmer's market to get Organic vegetables, really, really fresh. And um, they have the best fresh fish in New York there. And um, and also a, a really nice, very, um, uh, well, we'll close our eyes to the calories, a beautiful dessert. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes you don't want to look at the numbers. <laughs> No. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fun. So you were mentioning that cooking for you is kind of a release away from business, emails, and practicing. Well, yeah. You know, because I'm, I, I work at home, and, and I'm at home most of the time, unless I'm traveling. So, um, you know, my schedule is very flexible. It's very independent. Um, that's the good news. Um, I have to make every decision about every minute of the day. And, you know, there's only so much practicing you can do. And I do a lot. And then there's only so much business and how many emails can you write. And um, and I exercise. And then, you know, it's time to just relax. And, and I find that making the effort to make a nice meal – is 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 really worth it. I mean, I admit, as a single person, occasionally I just throw something together. But you know, path of least resistance. But all, but but several times a week, I actually do really think it through and try to make something nice. Hmm. Yeah, I resonate with that a lot. Just because my husband and I are both self-employed, and so I find if I don't break up my day, you know, and go to the market or go out and exercise, and if I just stay in the apartment, I will go stir crazy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then a nice meal to you know round off the day is is relaxing because you get to enjoy your food that way. Indeed. Yeah. Great. So for those who may or may not know you, could you please share with the audience um, 
a little bit about your background and who you are? Okay. Um, well, let's see. We'll start at the very basic level. Um, I am a human being uh, named, named Robert Dick. Um, and I grew up here in New York City. I am a native New Yorker. Uh, I've lived many other places in the course of my life, but New York more than any other. Um, I started to play the flute when I was eight years old because I wanted to. Uh, and my parents um, came through. And I came home from fourth grade one day to the best surprise of my life, which was a flute teacher and a flute. Um, I gave my first concert that night when my father came home from work. I set up two chairs and I huffed and puffed through Rubank Elementary Method Book One, Page One, Exercise One, and um, and it was Concert One, and um, I could not have articulated it at the time. But on a very deep level, I knew I had found my direction in life. And, um, and I've never wavered from that. Um, I, I'm, I've always wanted to play the flute and I've always wanted to play music. Um, and, and, and of course, music is the bigger circle in the Venn diagram than the flute. Uh -huh. uh, but my spirit seems to want to express itself through the flute. And um, very on, very early on, I bumped up with some of the big limitations of the flute, like the one note at a time thing. And, um, you know, when I first started to play, the most exciting moment of, of every lesson was the new note moment. Huh. And, you know, you learn a couple of new notes and you're going up and up and up and up. Uh, and one day my teacher and I came to the new note moment and I was expectantly waiting to learn. Well, it would have been high C sharp and high D. Uh, and he went right on. And I said, well, don't don't we have any new notes? And he said, well, no, you know all the notes. Um, I knew up to high C. Um, there are more. The flute does go to F sharp, but, um, and so I said, well, don't we do two notes now? Because I had thought hmm. that um, all the instruments did that. Huh. And, and the examples I had seen bore that out because my mother was a classical pianist and she, um, she was a great teacher for beginners. And, um, she had a wonderful rapport with kids. And so I heard her start innumerable students. And they started with one note at a time. And then soon there was something in the right hand and something in the left hand. And that proceeded to develop. My older brother played the cello and um, he was sawing away at one note. And after a while, he was sawing away at two notes. So I thought all the instruments did that. And, you know, I was excitedly and patiently, you know, going through phase one, which was one note. And I figure once you learn all the notes, we'll move on to two. Hmm. And that's when my teacher broke the news. Huh. The flute plays only one note at a time. And I was outraged. Wow. Um, I mean, really, I, I, there was this, this would have been a couple of months after my ninth birthday and there was smoke pouring out of my young ears um, and and again I couldn't tell you where it came from but somewhere deep inside I just thought to myself that's going to change <laughs> and it has <laughs> yeah yeah uh, and so, you know, my, my early development was not significantly different than most classical flute students. Um, you know, I learned the standard repertoire. Um, I played in orchestras, and I thought eventually I would be an orchestral player. 
I mean, where my development did significantly differ was that being in New York, I had many opportunities that many other talented students just didn't get. Mm. Um, excellent teaching, um, a very good school orchestra program. I went to the High School of Music and Art where we had five bands and four orchestras. Um, and I went to the Tanglewood High School program when I was 15, where I studied with uh, James Papatsakis and was in a Bach sonata course with Dorio Anthony Dwyer, something that changed my life. And, um, and so, you know, while in a sense it was the standard pathway, it was rocket propelled. Mm. And I was, um, you know, I guess I, I was the kind of student I certainly would love to have. Hmm. And, and I have had a few students like that. And what a joy. But, um, you know, if you asked me to do X, Y, and Z for a lesson, I came in with X, Y, and Z, also D, E, F, and H. Hmm. So, um, because I totally loved what I was doing. Hmm. And and um, and so the creative side started to wake up um, in in high school a bit and in college. Um, at one time, I saw a picture of a flute player with one arm. Wow! Uh, um, his name was Count Rebsamen, and all I know about Count Rebsamen is that um, it was apparently in the Boer Wars that a cannonball took one of his arms, his shoulder and an arm away. And uh, miraculously he survived, which was a pretty low probability thing, but he did. And, you know, he was one of the countless Victorian gentlemen flutists playing the kind of music that would just make you want to throw up and um, um, and to this day, I mean, I cannot bear the Victorian stuff. And, um, well, someone built him a simple system flute, which had extra mechanism on it, so that with, I believe he had his right hand, so that he could play the missing left-hand notes. Huh. And I thought to myself, well, if the Count can play a flute with one body, with one hand, I could play a flute with two bodies, with two hands. Hmm. Yeah. And so that was my first um, concept for playing multiphonics, was you'd have a regular head joint, and it would go to this kind of Y jack and go to two bodies. Now, I have since learned from acousticians all the reasons why that wouldn't work. Um, and it's quite understandable. But, you know, for a little kid, I thought it was pretty creative thinking. Yeah. Um, and so in college, um, and I, I didn't go to a conservatory. Um, I, I went to Yale, and which ultimately was a much better choice. Um, and that environment, creativity was really nurtured and supported. Um and um, and it wasn't, you know, just the endless competition for who can play first flute in the best orchestra. Hmm. Um, and I was very glad uh, to be away from that kind of competition at that point in my life. Um, and and it was there that I started to just explore the various sounds of the flute. Um, I had realized when I was 19 that I wasn't going to be an orchestra player. A summer at the fellowship level at Tanglewood showed me that. Hmm. Uh, and, I, and I'm very grateful to Tanglewood because they kept their promise. They gave you the experience of orchestral playing at the highest level. And it enabled me to make the choice that it wasn't for me. Hmm. Um, the... Um, the person with the stick had to go. 
Um, I, I just, you know, I just didn't want to be following people. I mean, hmm. it just, it just seemed ridiculous. Hmm. And, um, and I gave up on that direction knowing it was probably in mon- monetary terms, the most expensive decision I ever made in my life. Hmm. Um, and, you know, there's no sword that is single edged. Everything is double edged. And I went for musical freedom and artistic fulfillment. And I knew very well that I was going to pay a price for that. And I have. Hmm. Um, so on the other hand, I've made a life doing it my way. I have a family and I'm doing all right. So, um, and I know I would have been deeply, deeply unhappy in, in the orchestra. Uh, now, for anyone out there whose dream is the orchestra, go for it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that my way is the way, but it is the way for me. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and there are a lot of other creative young musicians who are also forging their own pathways. And I do my best to help them as a teacher and, and as, a, as a mentor. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, I have invented thousands and thousands of new sonorities on the flute um, and published various books. Uh, the first one was called The Other Flute, a performance manual of contemporary techniques. And that came out when I was 25 um, and originally published by Oxford University Press. Um, It's since been republished by me on my press, Multiple Breath Music, where all of my publications and music are. Um, And I'm I'm in a long line of self-publishers, which started with people like Telemann, hmm. who published his own music. And um, one of the reasons Telemann's music looks so, is so difficult to read is that he engraved the copper plates himself to save money. And Telemann was a great composer and a mediocre engraver. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, so there are all these kind of blobs there. Is it a flat? Is it a natural? <laughs> he said, well, I'm sure he thought, well, they'll figure it out. Yeah. And, and we have. So, um, and so I, um, I have played through most of the world um, I, uh, I, on every continent except Africa. And I hope to rectify that one day. I really do. Huh. Um, and and I play my own music. I evolved from a classical flutist to a flutist who became very passionate about contemporary music to that passionate flutist commissioning composers and having music written for him to writing my own music um, and to eventually uh, concentrate exclusively on my own stuff and improvisation. Hmm. And most of the performances I do today are um, entirely improvised. And I do those with other like-minded musicians and, um, or sometimes solo. And, um, you know, I mean, that's a very special challenge to walk out there by yourself and create the entire concert on, on the spot. Mm. Uh, and, and that comes from a great deal of experience. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it as a first-time thing, but uh, you, you build up to it like anything else. And um, I view the flute as a human-powered synthesizer. Um, and I feel that there isn't anything that I can imagine that I can't find a way to do. Hmm. Um, And primary inspirations for that came from electronic music. Um, I'm amongst the very last 
to study electronic music before the synthesizer. And that was really important because you had to think of everything. You started out with nothing, really nothing. Uh, once you turn the light switch on, you were on your own. And, um, and it was critical uh, for me in terms of changing my hearing and changing my imagination about sound. And then also, you know, people like Jimi Hendrix who created sound worlds of their own. And for somebody like me, who was embarking on the voyage of creating his own sound world, somebody like Hendrix who had, was doing it was immeasurably inspiring. Hmm. So um, I have written many pedagogical works um, and we're going to be delving into that kind of stuff today to begin with. And, um, you know, my best known book is called Tone Development Through Extended Techniques. Mm -hmm. I've also written uh, two volumes of etudes called Flying Lessons, uh, pieces for students. I wrote the first high school soloist competition piece for the National Flute Association, uh, Lookout. And Lookout has been played by thousands of flute players around the world uh, since 1989. And um, other pieces of mine are, are played often by students, such as Fisher Jumping. And, um, and so at every step of the way, I'm trying to put, you know, all the rungs into the ladder. Huh. You know, I mean, I understand where classical flute players came from. Yeah. And I understand where their strengths are, and there are many. And I also understand where the gaps are and where the weaknesses are. And, um, and where the very concept of what do you really need, you know, in, in terms of embouchure, articulation, things like that, you know, the, the very concept, it just isn't enough. Huh. Uh, if you want to go further, you've got to be much better than the typical classical player would expect to need to be. Huh. And um, not everybody wants to climb those mountains, huh. but I do, and, and others do as well. Very cool. Thank you so much for that elaborate background. And there's so many great gold nuggets in there. Just to kind of highlight them, you saying find your own niche within the music community. You know, you are encouraging students, you know, in all kinds, uh, professionals, amateurs, whoever to say, hey, you know, this is how I want to contribute and find my portion within the flute community. Yeah, well, you see, the world, whether we like it or not, has fundamentally changed. Huh. Uh, you know, my my first teacher, Henry Zlotnick, you know, grew up in a world where every flute player who was, you know, even moderately competent could be employed mm -hmm. in, a si in a silent movie theater. You know, there was a world where there literally was work for everyone, and it was the kind of work where you showed up, opened the book, and played what was in there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so doing what you were supposed to do was the way of the world, and there was something to do. Mm -hmm. um, um, now, from the dawning of my consciousness, where I felt like, okay, I am a musician, uh, which would have been, you know, in high school is when I started my first professional work. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, it was just little church jobs and things like that. But I was actually playing music and getting paid. And from, the, from those days till now, I have seen nothing but a contraction of, you know, there's simply less and less in the infrastructure. And so a career in music today is a great big do-it-yourself kit. Mm -hmm. And the 
the the the or question has changed. It's not, you know, how can I get the best job out there? You know, how can I do what I'm supposed to do to a, a much more, to, to my mind, a much more interesting and artistically meaningful, who am I? Hmm. What, you know, who am I, who am I as a musician? Where would I, where, where do I want to go as a musician? How can I make that happen? Hmm. Now, this is a much tougher pathway. Um, you know, back when, you know, if you just were prepared, the call would come. That's what Henry always told me. Hmm. He said, don't worry about it. You just got to practice. You will be heard. The call will come. Someday somebody's going to be sick or double booked or whatever, and the contractor is going to go down his book and call everybody he knows, and everybody can't make it. And finally he's going to say, you know, I guess I'll try this kid, Robert Dick. Hmm. <laughs> so, um, and that used to be the way of the world. Mm -hmm. And... and you know, there may be some microcosm of that left. And if it is, it's in Europe. It's not in America. Hmm. Um, and it, and even in Europe, it's not what it was. Um, and, you know, don't let what you, what you read in all those flutist magazines <laughs> uh, make you feel like oh, everybody's got it great because they don't. Hmm. Um, and I, I spent a great deal of time in Europe. So uh, I'm... I'm and I've lived there extensively. So, you know, I do have a firsthand in-depth point of view. Um, but it's the, that key. It's all a big do-it-yourself kit. And if you're not the kind of person who's going to welcome that, well, then there are many other things you can do with your life and and that hopefully will bring you rewards and happiness. Hmm. Um, but you have to be willing to engage in that challenge and know that for your skill level, you're probably going to be earning a great deal less than someone else in some other profession at whatever the analogous skill level might be. Yeah, so much of that resonates with me, especially in this chapter of my life and the season in which I'm in right now. When we were talking about the series a week ago and you were sharing your insights and how you would like this series to be organized, remember how I mentioned I was moving to Greece? Yeah. Yeah. And right now I'm living with my brothers in laws in Corpus Christi. And because our lease in Fort Worth ended, but I finally decided that the projects and the work that I did in the Texas area basically for me came to an end. I felt like there were more opportunities and I could be, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, but it wasn't fulfilling to me anymore. Like musically, I wasn't being satisfied and I felt like I was just beating the same horse. And so I just said, you know what, I'm going to see the resources that I have and use it to my advantage. And one of those main resources that I do have is that my husband and I own an audio and video editing production company and it's remote. And I thought, wait a second, a lot of uh, musicians don't have that luxury to work anywhere they want to in the world and still have a stable income. And so I said, you know what, we're going to uproot from Fort Worth, our home that we've uh, called home for 10 years. And let's try it. Let's be digital nomads. Let's go over to Europe. Let me book some uh, recitals and give master classes and do these, you know, little mini tours and play with people that I want to play with and to see what opportunities, you know, and what doors can open from that approach. And so a lot of what you just said about you have to make your own, <laughs> especially in today's world and what it means to be a musician. Um, it's not, like what you said, going down the list and, oh, you know, the 10th person, oh, let me call Robert Dick now. That's not our world anymore. It's really not. Yeah. So, and one fine day, Frodo left the Shire to go out and explore the world. 
<laughs> you know, um, that's um, you know, and and the result of that was the Lord of the Rings. Hmm. So, um, and um, yeah, so it's a big world out there. Yeah, and um, I I particularly feel that for Americans, you know, because we are far away from other countries, mm-hmm. um, and we really have no understanding um, on a human level of what other cultures are like. Hmm. And living abroad for a period and coming back, or some people just, you know, stay abroad, but living abroad, I, I feel, was one of the very most valuable things I ever did um, to to develop myself as a person huh. and, and, um, and there are other points of view and, um, you know, to discover that, um, you know, a lot of people just don't see things the way Americans tend to see things and their point of view has got a lot of truth to it for their reality. Mm. Um, and um, it's it's it is you know there are all these cliches about it. it's broadening it's deepening it's true and um, you know and and that would I think if if somehow everyone in the world could live somewhere else for a while we would have a much more peaceful and a much more um, interesting much more interesting. Uh, and productive world. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. You know, because you also discover the ways that we are all the same. Mm-hmm. A- and, uh, you know, somebody who's been taught some other religion is not a monster, but happens to be somebody who loves his children and loves her children and wants the best for them, just like you and me. Hmm. You know, yeah. so. Yeah. Um, and, so, uh, and, and unfortunately, our current government is a case in point for exactly how that fails when isolation is considered the way to go. Yeah. Um, you know, things just get worse and worse, not better and better. Yeah, very true. Oh, man, I could pick your brain all day and <laughs> talk to you um, just so openly and candidly, um, but I do want to... Um, bring it back in to the topic. And before we get into extended techniques and the fundamentals and defining these different techniques, I would like to read a sentence out of your book, The Other Flute. I thought it was a very good point, And I think it's something just to kind of highlight the theme of today's episode, or to remember why we're doing this. In this light, It is also significant to note that many flutists may find working with the new sonorities and techniques beneficial to their traditional playing, especially in the area of tone development. So I think one of the reasons why uh, you wanted to showcase, of course, your work and um, huge endeavors within our community is to showcase the fact that, hey, if we can play around and experiment with these different sonorities, it could really help the traditional sense of practicing our flute. Yeah, but, you know, let me reframe that. Okay. Because um, you're thinking of it too much the way regular flute players think of it. Okay. Now, number one, if I rewrote that sentence today, um, after um, the long, you know, the de- many decades of experience, it wouldn't read flutists may find. Mm. It would be flutists will find. Hmm. Um, because the jury's out. There's no questions about this anymore. There's a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience. And since we have the knowledge we're responsible for using it. Now, one of the things I hope to leave as a legacy is that I help flute playing improve as a whole mm-hmm. um, and not just, you know, in one area of, of music. I, I would like to feel that I've helped 
flutists who are interested in music that doesn't interest me at all. Hmm. Um, and, you know, music is very, very, very big and nobody can do it all. And we all have our personal tastes. And, you know, most of the French school stuff is not to my taste, but I would like to feel that I've helped people play it better. Hmm. So, um, now, playing the flute is playing the flute. And the production side of things should be completely logical, completely consistent, and that's logical and consistent with the nature of sound itself, huh. the, the nature of the human body, and the nature of the flute. Now, the mystery is in the human spirit. The mystery is in the music. The mystery is in the emotional meaning and emotional communication. Uh, it's not... It, the mystery is not in blowing air into a tube. Hmm. Um, and, and it amazes me how many people don't actually understand what's going on with that. Because once you understand, you're on your way to, you know, a quantum level of improvement. So the first thing I'd like to start with is how the flute actually works. Hmm. And, um, now, everybody knows part of the story, you know, that you blow the air and you blow over the embouchure hole and the air hits the edge, the far edge of the embouchure hole, and it flips in and out of the, you know, the flute. And that, in this wonderful acoustic term, that excites the air inside the flute into vibration and the sound goes out into the world and everybody loves it. <laughs> Now, that's completely true, um, but it's less than half of what's going on. And, <clears throat> but most people only know that part. And according to that part, we are fancy air pumps hmm. with a, a deluxe nozzle on the top. Hmm. Um, and the sound is made in the flute. And it's not. Um, the sound is partially made in the flute, but it is profoundly made inside of us. Huh. Now, um, I studied acoustics, and I did the work, and I worked personally with um, the great acoustician Arthur Bernard. Um, and well, what a difficult person, but his knowledge was something that I really, really needed. And um, and so, while when you blow a note, the air molecules are on the one-way trip that we just described, the sound is not. Hmm. The sound is on a, going on a much more complicated journey. Some of it is indeed going out into the world, and hopefully everyone loves it. But a very meaningful part is traveling back up your airstream and through you. Mm -hmm. And it's being shaped. Now, sound is, you know, moving along very, very fast. And it's moving through four primary resonators, which are your chest, your throat, your mouth, and the flute. Um, and the very powerful secondary resonators, your sinuses. Mm. And we treat them as secondary because we can't change their shape voluntarily. Um, everything else you can change the shape of and do things with, but the sinuses are, are, are just there. But they're really powerful, as it's easy to demonstrate. <laughs> so, um, and, because um, I just shut them off and we heard what happened, um, so this sound, you know, most flutists suffer from mysterious bad days. Huh. And, and I'm talking about not just kids, but professionals and people have been playing, you know, all their life. I still hear people say, oh God, it was just a bad day. I couldn't make a sound. Um, and as a student, 
I that drove me crazy, and I determined that I was going to solve that problem. Hmm. Well, look, if you can sound good on one day, that should mean you could sound good every day. Hmm. I mean, you know, whether you have your tone or not is not dependent on the weather. Um, it's not dependent on any external forces. There is no nasty little deity making these decisions. Um, you know, um, it's something happening inside of us that wasn't understood. And, um, and I went on a long um, quest for that knowledge um, and, and found it. Uh, so it was understanding about what happens inside of us. And we're dealing with a physical force, um, resonance. And resonance applies to everybody. What I'm going to say applies to you, whoever you are, without exception. Um, just like gravity. I mean, your opinion of gravity doesn't change gravity. Um, your opinion of resonance doesn't change resonance. It's there. So... And if you use it, it's going to be a very powerful force working for you. And if you don't understand it or you misuse it, it's a very powerful force working against you. Hmm. So, um, and the key way to match the resonances in your body with the resonances in the flute is called throat tuning. And this is the underpinning of all flute playing, regardless of where you want it to lead to uh, musically. Um, and it's the underpinning of all kinds of flutes around the world. It applies just as much to the kena and the bonsuri and the shakuhachi as it does to the traverso and the bame flute. So, um, so, uh, now, throat tuning is simply holding your vocal cords as if you were going to sing the note that you're playing. And you don't have to be in the same octave as the flute. So if, for example, the note that you want to play is an A natural, behind that A natural, I'm set up as if I'm going to sing an A natural in the octave that is free and comfortable for me at this moment. <laughs> so in essence, I've tuned my body to an A and I am now the resonant body of the flute. <laughs> now, if you to, I'll to do my best now to do the opposite. The, the most anti-resonant note for an A natural would be an E flat, a, a tritone away. Okay. So, you know. And it's very hard to actually sing the tritone with the flute because the resonance of the flute are reaching down your throat, trying to pull you into unison. Hmm. Um, but... <laughs> you hear how less alive that A sounded? Yeah, definitely. And here it is now with the A behind it. So... Hmm. Um, the flutists who play best all sing. Julius Baker sang. Julius Baker actually had a vocal coach huh. while he was a you know principal flute in the New York Philharmonic. Wow. Jean Pierre Rampal came from the French conservatory tradition, in which um, you, your musical education begins 
not in a flute lesson, but in a soul fetch class. Huh. And you sing every day, all the way through, um, and it just becomes second nature and intuitive. Um, my favorite flutist is one that most of our listeners will never have heard of, of uh, the North Indian um, Hindustani flutist, Hari Prasad Chavalsia. Hmm. I'm going to spell that name because hopefully the curious among you out there will go to YouTube and check him out. Hari Prasad, H-A-R-I, P-R-A-S-A-T, and his family name is Chorousia, C-H-A-U-R-A-S-I-A, C-H-A-U-R-A-S-I-A. The only flutist that I own 20 CDs by. Hmm. Um, and Hari Prasad came from a very poor village in India, um, and no one had any money for instruments, so he began as a singer. Because you don't have to buy anything to sing. Hmm. Um, now, and you can hear his singing in every note he plays, and his story is paralleled remarkably by another young flutist who grew up in a very poor part of the world, Belfast, Ireland, uh, where his father was a worker in the shipyards um, and worked on the Titanic, actually. And, you know, no one that James Galway knew had any money for instruments. So they sang and sang and sang all the time. Hmm. And you can hear the singing in every note that Jimmy plays. Hmm. So... If it worked for Galway, if it worked for Baker, if it worked for Hari Prasad Chirvasi, if it worked for Ron Paul, if it worked for great flutists like Dorio Anthony Dwyer and Carol Winsense, it will work for you. Um, because what they're doing is operating in harmony with the natural world. Hmm. Yeah, that's, you know, that's incredible. And, yeah, well, you see, that part got forgotten. Yeah. Um, when the French teachers, who most of American flutists can trace their lineage to, either George Barrere in New York or George um, Laurent in Boston, when they came to America – they proceeded in the same way they did in their flute studios in Paris, but they didn't bring the entire French conservatory with the daily solfege class with them. Hmm. And, you know, the singing doesn't have to be done in the flute lesson. It just has to be done every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but since most Americans and most European now, this is certainly very true for English and German players. Um, and don't sing. Then I try to integrate it into practicing. So um, if you get kind of, you know, my step one book, Tone Development Through Extended Techniques, and... Um, you can get that from my website, robertjick.net, or Flute World, or Flute Specialists. You know, flute shops everywhere all have it. And, um, and start working on the throat tuning um, and use the videos I put on YouTube. And there are three videos on throat tuning there, part one, two, and three. Um, that alone will give you an underpinning <clears throat> to your playing that will be really valuable. <clears throat> and the first thing that happens when you start practicing throat tuning is bad days just seem to absent themselves. They go away, mm -hmm. which is where they're supposed to go away, far away. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, nice. So, so from there, we can then talk about building the embouchure. Now, it's important to realize that sound is built from the ground up, not the lips back. Mm -hmm. And the embouchure and the flute are the last things in the chain of events, not the first. Mm -hmm. So sound begins with hearing. And this is where it's a fundamental difference from how most classical people are taught, which is they would say sound begins with playing the note on the page. And, you know, we see the note on the page. We know what the fingering is. You know, we know where that is. Um, with our embouchure, we blow it. And out it comes, and then we hear it. And that's too late. Mm. You know, we can't tell the story if we don't know it. Yep. Uh, so, so the very first thing that always begins is as best you can. Try to pre-hear the note you're going to play. Now, I don't have perfect pitch, and I've got good relative pitch. Mm. So once I'm started, I'm I'm okay. I can hear my way through things. But you know, I do what millions have done. I'll give myself the first note. I'll plunk it out on my keyboard or something, and. <clears throat> So then I know where it is. Then I hear it in my head and I try to feel it in my throat. And, you know, again, if it's an A, I'm hearing the A, I'm feeling it. And thank goodness I didn't miss. So <laughs> if I did miss, I would just fix it. Hmm. Yeah, that, no. that was a bullseye. <laughs> yeah, well, they weren't bullseyes when I started. Yep. Um, and sometimes they weren't even on the target. Yep. Miss, missed by a mile. Mm -hmm. And now, if we listen carefully, we can hear many of our podcaster, podcast listeners saying, and we can hear you, <laughs> say, I can't sing. Yep. But I can't sing. And the answer to that is, of course you can. Yep. You don't sing. Yep. It's not that you can't sing. It's that you don't sing. And anything you don't do, you're not going to be good at. Yep. Um, so now many, many musicians – classically trained, have trouble matching a pitch they hear with their voice. Mm -hmm. And they assume that the problem is that that's the deep, dark truth that they can't actually really hear. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked with a pretty famous flute player a couple of years ago, and that's what she said. And I, I'm not going to say her name. Um, but, and I said, no, 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 no. I mean, I've heard you play. <laughs> the cat's out of the bag. You know, you're a really musical person. You can hear just fine. But you've never worked on connecting your good hearing to your voice. Huh. And so the connection sounds like something that's never been worked on. Huh. So if we're willing to go to day one and be a beginner, if, we, if we're someone who has, has never sung or has only sung a tiny bit or only sung when they were made to sing and there was no escape, um, I was all of those people. Huh. Uh, I, I hated to sing because I was dreadful at it. And, and I would go to any length to avoid it. Huh. You know, I, I mouthed things in chorus without singing them. Huh. And um, 
I was perfectly in tune with silence. And <laughs> so, um, and, but when I realized that the connection between the voice and the flute was so profound, I mean, it was as basic as blowing the air, then I said, okay, I'm going to leave the group of non-singers and humbly approach the group of singers and ask if I can join them as a day one beginner. So, and I did. So, um, so anyway, but here we go. Sound begins with posture and breath. Hmm. And, and there's a lot of good material out there about posture. You know, there's all that wonderful stuff the body mapping people do. Um, so, you know, please, everybody, check them out. Um, they're very valuable things uh, to be learned about how to use your body in harmony with the way it's made. Uh, and if you do that, you'll be playing when you're 95 years old huh. uh, and playing really well. Then posture and then breath. Um, I have made a contribution to that. There is a video up on YouTube called um, Prepare to Breathe. And I, I would urge people who haven't seen it to see it and practice the simple little exercise that I'm showing there. Huh. It, 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 it'll help you really breathe efficiently and understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and not make noise when you breathe. Okay, huh. so then from posture and breath, the air leaves the lungs and comes to the throat. And we've talked about throat tuning. Then it gets to the mouth where we need to pronounce it. There always is one, so it's best if we choose it. Um, and the, the starting syllables for um, flute playing are simply ooh and ah. Now, those are the starting syllables. <clears throat> We're gonna you know, work through, when you play a piece of music, you change the syllables just the way a singer would. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, no singer would ever go through a whole song on ooh alone, <laughs> unless it was a comedy thing. Um, you know, Pat Benatar had a wonderful thing called the ooh ooh song, <laughs> but I think there were some ahs in there too. Um, and oh, I was a huge Pat Benat Benatar fan in the eighties. Oh, cool! Uh, what a great singer and what a great band. So, um, and, you know, I love the guitar player and the drummer and the bass player and the keyboard player. They were just a fantastic musical unit. Um, and so, um, anyway, ooh, the basic syllable, ooh, and we want to use open Italian vowels. It's not uh, uh, but ooh. Ooh, you know, like you've just seen something that gives you real pleasure. Ooh. I mean, look at that bowl of pasta. Look at that sauce. Smell that incredible aroma. Ooh. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and basically, ooh is from the fourth ledger, the uh, fourth line of the staff, G. Down. And ah is from the E flat or G sharp. On up. Hmm. Um, the third octave of the flute sounds a little more like E. But if you back it up with E, um, it'll, it can get shrill. It's a special case kind of thing. It's great in the orchestra when you have to cut through traffic. Um, well, you do. Yeah. 
Um, um, I, I did have a professional orchestra part of my career that just happened, kind of. I was principal flute in the Brooklyn Philharmonic for five years um, and, and, you know, really found out about using all these things that all my orchestral flute player friends had been talking about. Um, and so then after posture, breath, throat, mouth, we come to the embouchure and the jaw and the lips. Now, it is my opinion that and based on, you know, hearing thousands of flute players in master classes, uh, most flutists are not strong enough to play the flute well. <laughs> and the lip strength that James Galway brings to the game is in a completely different league than what most players bring. The lip strength that Baker brought to the game was enormously more. Huh. Um, and so uh, the best way to develop the strength of your lips is to practice natural harmonics. Huh. And um, so, and, and again, the tone development through extended techniques is a whole chapter of, you know, natural harmonic boot camp. Yeah. Uh, you will feel like you have climbed a three-story building with your lower lip. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a great feeling. And it will open the doorway to a lot of things that you wonder, like, how on earth can they do that? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the answers is very primal. They're strong enough to do it. So I would recommend if you've never, and, and we'll need to go to video for some of this, because when I discuss jaw positions, it'll be a lot easier um, if people can see it. Yes, definitely. I think that's wonderful that you are able and willing to um, show the listeners a video portion of some of these techniques. So for the Flute 360 listeners who are listening on their car and you are commuting, go home and check out my website where I will have posted some videos of Robert Dick demonstrating these extended techniques. Thank you, Robert, for your time, and I will uh, see you here in a bit. Okay, super. Okay. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable, from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. For more information, please visit HeidiKBegay.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute.